to have you here this week for the fifth week of How Then Shall We Live? Clarifying Conversations in Corinthians. So last week, Bill Brown, our resident expert on grace and truth, shared with us out of 1 Corinthians 5. And this week, we're looking at the second half of 1 Corinthians 6, and we're dealing with something that's much more related to my field of expertise and experience, dealing with dysfunction. That's my game right there. And uh, we've been sitting down for a while now, so uh, why don't you stand up and greet somebody around you and say, listen up, Uh, I think you must be talking to somebody else tonight other than you. Go for it. All righty. Make sure that you continue the conversation. Make sure that after the service, you continue that conversation. Uh, I don't know about you, but they say that when you look through the retrospectoscope, when you look back, uh, it's often 2020 vision. You can see really clearly when you look back. And uh, everybody's an expert when they look back. Sometimes when we uh, look back and we wonder what on earth was going through their minds. There are, it seems, a lot of bad ideas that seem like such a good idea at the time. Great idea around uh, the turn of the 20th century was this one, asbestos pipes. Millions have been sold and in daily use throughout the civilised world. That's a real ad. Ingenious, don't you reckon? Asbestos pipes, just in case the tobacco doesn't get you. (laughs) I reckon I've got to get me one of those. But it gets better. 30 years down the track, they'd woken up to themselves and people had moved on to a far safer product. 20,679 physicians say that luckies are less irritating. It's toasted. Your throat protection against irritation and against cough. Probably not against cancer, but if 20,000 physicians are saying it, it must be true. So many good ideas. And while we're on the subject of cigarettes, have a look at this one. These are beauties. Doctor's Choice, the quality blend, candy cigarettes, awesome. And then the other ones, just like dad, candy cigarettes for your kids. What a great idea. I showed Joanne uh, these ads and and, uh, we had a look at the candy cigarettes and she said, and I reckon she was accurate about this, it makes you wonder what other popular things we'll look back on and gasp in horror. What things we do and are into today that we'll look back on and go, what on earth were we thinking? So much information and so little time to process it. Not every idea we hear is a good one. Not every practice or habit is a healthy one. And yet, good, bad or ugly, we continue to accumulate them, accumulate ideas. As the world around us continues to inform and influence us, what should we take on and what should we not? I reckon this has been a question for followers of Jesus all the way down the ages. What's good? What's not? What should we take? What should we not? Last week in the How Then Shall We Live series, Bill talked to us about walking the tightrope between grace and truth and how difficult that can be when talking with one another. How we can best deal with others, particularly when they're losing the plot. This week, we're not talking about other people's stuff. We're not talking about their rubbish. We're going to talk about our own. And we're going to look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians to make that assessment. The Corinthians were in a world of hurt morally. All sorts of stuff was going on in and around the Corinthian church. As part of a depraved society, it seems that the Corinthian church and had very much adopted the morals and the ideals of the world around them. And Paul calls them to a different standard. And in doing this, he finds himself heavily critiquing their actions and behaviour. And in no uncertain terms, Paul exhorts the Corinthians to live by a different standard. He encourages them to take up life, the life that they're called to, a life in Christ, in the world, but not of it. 
we listen to Paul's words, uh, they can be particularly helpful in the world that we live in. I reckon in a world that is extraordinarily assertive about its own version of morality, the question to ask is how can we live, how can we listen and respond to the voice of Jesus? There's so many other voices that we are exposed to in any given day, in any given week. How can we hear Jesus and respond to him in it? As followers of Jesus, how can we get on board with his view of life and how can we be active and useful participants in the world but not become victims morally, spiritually or intellectually? little warning before we open the word this evening. Paul's words to the Corinthians are not easy to hear, okay? So fasten your seatbelts. He confronts them openly and honestly about their situation and then he gives them an M-rated assessment of their behaviours and practices. It's going to be, you're going to be shocked, I think, about how badly the Corinthians had lost the plot. But I'm not really that worried about them this evening. I'm much more worried about us. I'm much more concerned about what we hear from God. So why don't we pray together before we open the word. Lord, I ask that as we open your word tonight, that you might enable us to hear you. Lord, we bring lots of stuff in here, all of us. And God, I'm just asking that you cut through all of that tonight and that you'd speak directly to each one of us. And I include myself in this. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, I was in Indonesia on a missions trip. And uh, I was with a bunch of other pastors and uh, one of the places that we stayed was near the equator and it was hot. And I don't know about you, but I haven't got a very good cooling system in my body. So when it's hot, I just sweat like a water buffalo. I just, like it's bad. I get really hot, really sweaty. And here we are, we're up on the equator and we're sweating it out and uh, it's not pleasant. Um, one day, one of the, pa- the other pastors and myself wandered down to a nearby beach and we asked a local if it was okay to swim and they said yes. Now, I've got a picture of the beach. I think this is the beach we went to. Uh, this this is, looks identical to the beach that we went to. It was beautiful, a stunning, stunning beach. And so uh, they said it was safe, so we were hot and sweaty and we didn't need any further invitation, so in we went. The water was cool but not too cool. And it was unbelievably refreshing as we made our way out and uh, it was pretty shallow, so we were, uh, we could swim a few hundred metres offshore and I could still stand on the bottom. So it was quite shallow, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> I was able to stand up about 300 metres offshore. So we we get out there, we swim out and we're enjoying it and then we're just standing offshore. I'm up to my shoulders. He's not, but I am. And it's just beautiful. And we're standing there and we're yakking away in this just idyllic place with this in this beautiful uh, beach. And a brown slick passed by me about a metre on my right and I looked at it and I didn't think much about it. And then a couple of minutes later, as we just kept ch- chatting, uh, another brown slick went past, and this time there was an unmistakable smell to it. And my pastor mate said to me, he looked at me and he said, is that what I think it is? And you know in some films when they flash back to a horrific moment and everything slows down, goes into slow-mo, it, it was like that. It was like, in that particular moment, uh, me and my mate realised with horror that we were swimming in the direct path of raw sewerage coming out of the houses about half a K up the beach. And it was not a pleasant realisation, I've got to tell you. We almost walked on water back to the shore. We were moving that quickly. Seriously, it was quick. And needless to say, on the way in, We did not submerge our heads once on the way in. We did on the way out, but not on the way in. And we were sick for days. My mate was violently ill, and uh, we almost had to put him on a plane home. He was so sick. I want to say that not everything that looks good is good. And not everything that feels good is good. 
Freedom at its cracking best is never without boundaries and guidelines. We were free to go swimming that day, but we were not wise to. At least it was only ignorance in play. It would be stupidity, would it not? We didn't know what was in the water, but wouldn't it be stupid if we did know what was in the water and the guide said, yeah, you can go swimming in that, there's raw sewage in there, and we had to said, yeah, okay, we're going in anyway. That would be stupidity, would it not? The Corinthians had a terribly flawed understanding of freedom, and many of them were declaring Christ as Lord, but not living out the full benefit of that in their lives. In actual fact, the number one excuse that the Corinthians give for their dysfunction is freedom. And Paul doesn't have a bar of it. He's not interested in that idea at all. He takes on their faulty theology head on. He says to them, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Most scholars seem to agree with Gordon Fee that this little phrase, it's like a what would Jesus do phrase, it's a theological slogan. It's the little slogan that the Corinthian church used to roll out. Because when Paul was talking about the kind of meat you ate and meat offered to idols and that sort of stuff, he was talking about a very specific issue. One of the words he used around that was you can use your freedom. But they used to use that for everything. They grabbed that and they ran with it. They turned it into a slogan and they began to say about everything that I got the right to do anything. I can do anything I like. Paul takes it on and he, he gets pretty fiery about it. Back to our little Indonesian experience. In fairness, if we, had, we, we did ask the local the wrong question. We did ask, can we swim at this beach? Yes, you've got the right to do anything. What we didn't ask is, should we swim at this beach? To which the answer would have been no, because not everything is beneficial. Understand this, making a great decision about what to do and what not to do has very little to do with our initial perception of it. What we desperately needed at that time was an accurate perspective, a perspective that took us beyond what we felt like. We were hot and we were sweaty and we were in the mood for a swim. We needed a perspective that helped us to see beyond the immediate lure of the water and actually make an intelligent decision. Paul offers a perspective just like that to the Corinthian church. There's a significant indication in the text here that the Corinthians were choosing to remain with the sins of the past and they were trying to justify themselves in it. They were trying to say, it's okay, lower the bar, you know, Uh, it's all right, Uh, everything is okay. An idea that was deeply ingrained in in Greek philosophy was the idea that the body and the soul were completely different entities. They were completely separate. Uh, One philosopher said, I'm a poor soul, soul, shackled to a corpse. In Greek thinking, the important thing was the soul. You've got to look after the soul, the spirit of a person. But the body was a thing that actually didn't matter at all. It produced two uh, different types of attitudes. One of them was a rigorous sort of asceticism, you know, beat yourself and make yourself feel bad, get rid of the bad stuff out of your body. Or the one in Corinth that was prevalent, the one that they took, the perspective that they took, was that since the body was of absolutely no importance, you could do whatever you liked with it. For neither the body nor the soul could impact each other. That's how they felt. How convenient. So those that had been seeing prostitutes before they became Christians were saying things about their behaviour with prostitutes. I'm free to do anything. Anything is permissible. And so Paul spends most of his time between verse 12 and 20 trying to convince them that sleeping with prostitutes is incongruent with following Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm just... Really? How the heck did they get there with that? How on earth did they get to a space where that was okay? I don't know about you, but but that troubles me deeply, that believers can lose the plot that badly. Paul says this. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Never. So those little words, members of Christ, 
actually refers to the idea of the body of Christ. When you sin, you know, we live in this, this individualist sort of world and we think that when we sin, it's just us that's impacted. We think that when we blow it, when we muck around, nobody knows about it, it's just me that's impacted. No, it's not. It's the whole body of Christ that's impacted. You ask those uh, Catholic parishioners that went to the churches of those priests who abused children, whether they're impacted by the behind the scenes behaviour of those guys. Don't think for a second that we do this in isolation. The members of the body of Christ and unite them with a prostitute. Uh, Never, says Paul. So we go back to this idea of what on earth happened for the Corinthian church to think that sleeping with prostitutes is okay. Like seriously, how did they get there? For us trying to justify sleeping with prostitutes is absolutely outrageous. But we need to remember that prostitution was part, a massive part of Corinthian culture. Shrine prostitutes numbered in the thousands. Prostitution was openly accepted. It was a perfectly normal part of Corinthian society. So rather than forsake these practices, the Corinthian church tried to justify them by saying, I've got the right to do anything. Anything is permissible. That's how they justified themselves. Here's the news for those who wish to follow Christ. Society doesn't call the shots on what we should or shouldn't do. Jesus does. Folks, that is part of the deal. That's what we sign up for. When we sign up to follow Jesus, we also sign up to let him make the calls on what we should or should not do. Immediately before today's passage, Paul had given the Corinthians a perspective that helped them see beyond their immediate temptations. And to do this, he reminded them of their path. past. Halfway through verse 9, he says this, Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkard, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Paul makes it clear that people in unrepentant sin have no place in the kingdom of God. He also allows the Corinthians to own their past. This is what you were, he says. The New Living Translation interprets the first part of verse 11 this way. It says, there was a time when some of you were just like that. There's been a lot of focus and attention lately because of the society we live in on homosexuality. But have a look at this list, seriously. There's not too many people in this room that would get off the hook. Have a look. Do not be deceived, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who have sex with men. Have you ever put anything before God? Anything. A girlfriend, a boyfriend, money, job, family. Have you ever put anything before God? That's idolatry. Have you ever had lustful thoughts about someone who is not your husband or wife? That's called sexual immorality. It's also adultery, according to the Jesus standard, just in case you're wondering. Have you ever had too much to drink? That qualifies you to be a drunkard. Have you ever talked negatively behind someone's back, actually taken parts out of their reputation behind their back? That's called slander. Have you ever done a shonky deal, not quite paid your tax, done a little bit shifty here, shifty there? Have you ever done any of that? Because that's called in the biblical vernacular swindling or dishonest dealing. Let's be honest though. In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul also spends a lot of energy going after people who are hanging out with prostitutes. And just in case you want to let yourself off the hook early on this one, for your information, the ancient Greek for prostitute is porne. That's how you say it. But if you just spell that word in English, it looks like this. Interesting word, isn't it? And yes, it is the word from which we get pornography, which in Greece, ancient Greece, was visually represented prostitution. 
I hate to burst the bubble on this, folks, but the current statistics conservatively estimate that over 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women are viewing pornography monthly. And if you're between the age of 18 to 30, the statistic goes up at least 10% and goes to weekly. That's Christian people. That's not non-Christian people. Just in case you're wondering what Jesus thinks about porn or pornography, Jesus is pretty clear on it. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or a man lustfully has already committed adultery with her or him in their heart. You know what? I've heard people use all sorts of language and excuses around the viewing and reading pornography as the Corinthian uses, Corinthians used around prostitution. I'm free to do anything. I'm free to look at anything. I'm free to do anything. It doesn't really matter. No, you're not. No, you're not. Paul makes it really, really clear in verse 19. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honour God with your bodies. I had a weird dream the other night. I'm not sure whether it was a stir fry or uh, the fact that I just put new tyres on my car. Not sure which one it was. But I dreamt that a young friend of mine was driving my car. And I was in the passenger seat and he began to drive like an absolute lunatic. I really liked my car. I was unhappy in my dream, I've got to tell you. I was very upset. There was rubber and smoke coming off the tyres. The engine was screaming. I was mad. I was actually quite angry in my dream. Apart from my new tyres being trashed, I was filthy on this young driver in my dream. This wasn't his car. He had no right to drive it like this. He'd not paid for the car and he clearly hadn't paid for the tyres. He had no right to treat it like this. You were bought at a price, said Paul. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. You are not your own. So stop living like you are, says Paul. You want to follow Jesus? He gets to make the call. What fascinates me is that I, when I think about our little swim in Indonesia, is that some of us know full well that our temptation is stinky and rancid, but it just looks so appealing sometimes, doesn't it? And so we swim, we knowingly swim in our rancid, stinky mess and then we hate ourselves afterwards and the cycle continues. Back to the list. Some of us just don't want to be slanderous. We don't want to be. But you are. You know, that juicy piece of gossip just can't help but pass it on. You don't want to be, but you are. It makes you feel better about yourself, so you keep returning to it, and the cycle continues. Some of us, around 60%, even more in this room, have the same issues that have plagued me over the years. You don't want to be attracted to pornography. You're probably disgusted that you are. You probably hate the fact that you are. But when you're in the temptation, it feels like you can't help it. And you don't get help because you're too ashamed So you continue to hide in plain sight. And behind the scenes, you continue to fail and the cycle continues. Some of us have gone way, way deeper than that. And you're up to your neck in some kind of immoral behaviour and you know you'll eventually get caught. You know you can't go it alone, but you continue to hide and you continue to try to go it alone and the cycle continues. Some of us are caught in a greed cycle, enough is never enough and the accumulation of possessions and wealth 
have begun to own you. And if you're to be honest, life's far more about the next purchase than it is, is about people or about Jesus. And you know you can't take it with you, but you're in the grip of mammon and you feel like you just can't stop and the cycle continues. See, it doesn't matter what your particular brand of dysfunction is. And it doesn't matter how heavily you're caught up in it. Paul offers hope. He calls the Corinthians out of their dysfunction and back to the one person who can change it. He says, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Paul reminds the Corinthians of the things that happened for the person who follows Christ. Some of you, but some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. That word there, now some scholars think that this might be a reference to baptism, and it may be, but I think it's fair to say that when Jesus comes into our lives, he cleanses us, makes us clean again. Washes the thoughts, washes the actions, washes the rubbish out of our heads, our minds and our hearts. The Holy Spirit cleans our minds. I've asked for God in my own journey with pornography, I've asked God for, to remove the memories, remove the images from my head and he does it, clears it. You were cleansed. That second one, you are made holy. That one there, that's the, the, there's a big word for that, sanctified. And it's a word that, that was used. That was the English word they used to use it. And it's an act of God to make reparation for guilt. The word in Greek here is hagiadzo. And it means that when you, you know the guilt that you carry when you drop the ball, whether it's accidentally or deliberately, when you muck it up, when you go back to your filth, the guilt that you carry there, hagiadzo, that made holy, that means the price is paid, it's done, it's finished. Jesus is enough. You are made holy by Jesus dying on the cross and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And finally, Paul talks about the mechanism. You were made right with God by, by what? By being good, by your own attempts to be holy, by church attendance, by appearing to be holy. Now, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here's a question for you tonight, and I'm going to finish on this. When was the last time you called on the name of Jesus Christ. You know, you can spend the rest of your days trying to be good and trying to make it or trying to justify and trying to lower the bar or you can call on the name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is writhing in agony on the cross and Luke tells us that the criminal next to him asks him for mercy and it's granted. This criminal has nothing to offer. He's a criminal. He's been a criminal for all we know for his whole life. He has no redemptive feature to bring to the table. He's on a cross and he's on a cross for his own crimes. And he says to Jesus, will you throw me a bone? Will you give me mercy? And Jesus says, yep. He's on the cross. Still says, yep. All we need to do is ask. You're in a mess this evening. Addicted. Enslaved. Messed up. Broken. Dysfunctional, angry, hurt, afraid. Cry out to Jesus. Some of you are thinking, I just don't deserve it. I've done it too many times and blown it too many times. Little note here, Paul doesn't talk about us deserving it. He simply names the mechanism. 
call on the name of Jesus. I've got a prayer for you to pray this evening that will help you do precisely that. And it's a prayer that's been used for thousands of years. It was devised by the ancient church fathers and it's taken from the prayer of the repentant tax collector in one of Jesus' parables. And it's a really simple prayer. You'll be able to remember it. It's very easy to remember. And the fathers suggested that we use this prayer daily, hourly, or minutely according to our needs. This prayer is a prayer of repentance, but it's a prayer that is also a cry for help. So we can use it this evening, and then you can use it for the rest of the evening or the week as required. You can use it for the rest of your life. It's easy to remember, and it also, I've discovered, happens to be a great disruptor for temptation. And the shortened version goes like this. It's called the Jesus Prayer. And a shortened version of it is, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. The longer version says, have have mercy on me, a sinner. But I think we already know that, don't we? I kind of like this one because it's also aspirational. kind of like what they've done with it. As we come to communion tonight, And as the stewards come up and prepare, we're going to pray that prayer. Communion, as outlined by Jesus, is a time to remember. On the night that he's betrayed, the Lord takes the bread and he gives thanks for it and then he breaks it into pieces and he says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When you take the bread tonight, Bring your stuff before him. Is it not time to be honest with Jesus? Stop lowering the bar, stop pretending it's not real, stop pretending that it's not there and actually be honest. So when we take the bread tonight, I want you to just bring some stuff before him. Just come before him and pray that little prayer. Actually, just pray the little prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And as we take the cup, hang on to it. And then I'm going to lead you in a really short little prayer time. And then we'll drink together. So bread, pray the prayer, hang on to the cup, and I'll talk to you then. At the Last Supper, Jesus took the wine And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink in remembrance. Why don't we drink together in remembrance? Remembering the forgiveness of sins Let's pray that Jesus prayer into our mess right now, huh? And let's get specific. And so, Lord, we come before you. And you know what we bring in tonight. You know what's been going on. Lord, for those of us that have lowered the bar who know wrong and still continue to do it, but those of us that have lowered the bar and said everything's permissible, everything's okay for me to do, we ask for forgiveness. We give you thanks that the cross has paid for our sin and we ask for forgiveness and we say, Lord, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Why don't you just bring whatever it is that's your thing to Jesus right now? Lord, some of us are even lowering the bar as we bring it to you. We're trying to minimise, trying to pretend it's not that bad, trying to pretend. And Lord, what's offensive is that we don't find it offensive.
And for this, we ask your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Why don't you pray that right now? for some of us we're just so desperate and broken and wrecked we don't know how to change we want to change but we don't know how to change and so God we come before you and we ask with genuine hearts Lord Jesus Son of God have mercy on me show us the way Lord, help us to be people who are defined by you, not the world around us. Help us to be people who live out the reality of your power and your spirit more and more. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.